Why don't you start off by just telling me who you are, <laughs> okay. who you are what, uh, what you do, and where you're at right now in, in your life. Oh, just a few small things. Yeah, just a, small just thing. a few small little snippets. Yeah. Well, I'm Claire Hedine, and I am British, living in California, Northern California, San Francisco area. And since moving over here about 30 years ago, I basically became an artist. I went to art school, which I'd never done before, and realized that there was no one medium through which I could express a truth in any given moment. And that all these different ways of communicating through art, any of the arts, are kind of available to suit the quality of uh, and the texture of something that's trying to communicate itself. So I, I kind of learned that over a long period of time because I've sort of gone through various disciplines. The most long lasting one uh, really being music. So becoming a sound healer, becoming a sound alchemist, realizing there's a slight difference between those two things that I find interesting. And, and then most, most recently, energy balls. And I say that with a smile because they make me laugh. There's, um, I've gone back to painting. I had a yearning to go back to painting and I kept putting it off. Partly, which is very typical for me, looking for like the reason, why would I do that? You know, what's that going to do for me? But gradually um, I sort of succumbed to that impulse, bought lots of watercolor paper and started painting. And then behind me, there are two examples of the energy balls. And if you're actually in a room with them, there's something that happens. There's a feeling and it makes me think of people like Rothko, for instance, who would do the sort of more linear um, line paintings. And the idea is, you know, you're meant to sit with it and meditate in a gallery or some kind of a quiet space. But these are a little different um, because the energy has more of a dynamic. So instead of being sort of calming, they're more interactive. So something, something really unique happens. Even for me painting them, I get quite nervous when I paint them in case I get it wrong. It's like, oh, I've got to find you. Like, it's like I'm looking to connect. And then when it happens, it's like I sort of dance around when I'm doing it, like that next stroke, the next stroke. Will this be the one that, that completes it or the one that sort of goes, oh, now you've lost it again. So it's a very tenuous dance. So what, what led you to paint the first one? How did you get started on that journey? Um, it was actually a very practical need. I was trying to fulfill a need, which was that I have a platform called Dynamic Emergence, and that's where people can study energy for themselves, study their own energy, the dynamics of how things come into being, and how people kind of generate a field of energy, and how we influence each other, affect our ability to show up fully um, affect each other's thinking processes, affect each other's sense of joy, even our uh, ability to be creative. And I needed a logo and I'd borrowed one off the internet, which I liked, but you know, it's not unique and it's not of the process itself. So I started doing these swirly paintings just as an experiment. And then over time, I realized actually there was something much bigger going on and the logo got forgotten uh, and I just kind of went deeper and deeper, a bit like Alice in Wonderland, kind of going down the well and, and just being open, being willing to see what happened next. So I kind of want to hear more about the, uh, the process of creating one and how that can spark anxiety or, <laughs> you know, nerves. So um, the very... The very first one I did, I didn't know what I was doing. And in a way, there's a beauty in that kind of, there's a freedom in that. Because I can't get it wrong. If I don't know what I'm doing, then, then it's only discovery, really, and exploration. Where does that pop How does that manifest? And what do you think that says about art and creating in general? So um, this idea that 
painting something, like combining paint and water and paper can create anxiety. Um, why? why? Why would that create anxiety? My understanding is that, that there's something actual happening. So I'm actually in a conversation. And there's something, you're kind of going off a cliff edge. It, you know, there's no way of knowing if I'm going to take the painting just that tiny bit too far. There's something about wanting to respect and honor the process itself. And so I almost feel like I'm showing up as a complete novice each time that could just totally get it wrong. But when I get it right, and quite often that is what happens because it just, there's a, there's a kind of like this energy that's pushing itself into being. And I'm, I'm the person that's kind of the translator of that. So I guess the anxiety is, will I do a good job? Will, will I be good enough at the crafting to be completely out of the way for the messaging? So I think that's probably the anxiety that happens. And near the end, like, because I'll do the first part, which is more of the central part. And then I have to make this massive decision. Do I do more? around it because sometimes I do and it it's it kind of doesn't work just doesn't work or do I stop where I'm at and I think that stopping when I choose to stop that kicks off anxiety because it's empty space and that means I have to trust empty space as um, an aspect of the becomingness expressing itself and I think as a human I I look to fill empty space right and I, as a musician you know the art of improvising musically either on my own or with other people is empty space like the the music is not music without the empty space giving it definition and as a sound healer it's the same thing so when I sing, if I'm sound healing for somebody, for a human, I'll sing and I warn them up front, there'll be empty space. And then I have to fulfill that. Like I have to remember empty space, Claire, because the sound is kind of activating a person's field. It's not my business to know what's happening inside them. It's my business to be as much out of the way as possible. Again, do the kind of the fluid mechanics of delivering sounds as they present to me and through me without opinion and then stop, just stop. And when we stop, all of a sudden that space fills up with energy and I can actually feel it doing that. So it's, it's all about this energy. So when I started doing the energy balls, like these characters, beautiful beings behind me, I realized the further I went down the rabbit hole of painting them, the more it was about the empty space or what a painter or photographer would call negative space, which is not a qualitative statement. It's just the, the relationship between sound and silence or paint and no paint. So the negative space helps define the, the positive space. So that, I guess you could think of it as yin yang too, right? So that, that dance of relationship, the dance of becoming, the dance of generating, the dance of receiving and listening. And you can't really generate something from beyond yourself if, if you're full up already with you. Because in a way, the me that would fill a page, if I'm not listening, is the me that got filled up with feelings and emotions and thoughts and ideas yesterday and the day before that and the day before that. So I have to become empty. And I think that's also part of the anxiety is, you know, anyone that's meditated knows this feeling, you know, you sit there and all of a sudden it's like, uh, you mean just be quiet? How terrifying is that for a human? Human doings, you know, the human busyness. I mean, like right now I'm talking a lot. If I just stop, there's a connection. And in that connection, nothing else really needs to happen.
Why do you think that we fear that empty space or that silence? So why? Why do we fear the empty space? Why do we fear the silence? Of course, firstly, not everyone does. And not everyone does all the time. I even find that question frightening. You know, like, why? What's the big deal? In dynamic emergence, there are two tenets. The first says that nothing is fixed. And the second says that energy waits to be noticed. I think, speaking for myself, if I fear sitting with myself, it's because I'm afraid that what I'm going to find I won't like, or that what I find won't like me. And that's a very painful thought. And as a thought, you know, thoughts have a lot of power if we give them power. And so as a thought, if I let that have dominance over the empty space, then I can't enter that room. I can't go there. And I don't know. I don't know why I'd have the assumption, oh, it must be something about me. You know, there must be something to avoid. But I know it's not unique to me. I'm not abnormally flawed. I am a classic human being living with these same kind of iterations of, of thoughts and concerns and interior prods that th there's an irony in this because at, if I actually do go quiet, so do the thoughts. You know, it can get noisy. But I think the noise is that turbulence, like when a rocket goes out to space and there's a period of time where it's going, I think, through the stratosphere, right, out of the atmosphere into the stratosphere. And that's like the worst part, as far as I understand, for turbulence and like I'm falling apart, I'm going to explode, I'm going to implode, take, you know, take your pick. I, I guess it's a fear of death, maybe. Because we don't know how we got here and we don't really know how we leave. We know what happens to our bodies. But we actually don't know what happens to us. And if you can't answer that question, I think that's a real driving force in a lot of our behavior, kind of a manic concern about what, what, what does it mean and what will it feel like and how long will it last? Control. <laughs> it's about control. So what is there to gain by entering that empty space or going into that silence and exploring it? So there is something to gain, obviously, these hard-won things um, by going into that empty space, by choosing to explore. And again, trying to stay with my experience of that is that I'm here to have relationships. And I find for me the most meaningful relationship is the one with what I would call the numinous and the liminal and the temenos. So these words all kind of speak to a spatial um, awareness of relationship, that there are dynamics at play. By going into the empty space, I give myself over to something bigger. Me, just as I am, you know, a little human being bouncing around through life. I mean, that's adequate in certain ways. But I live in something bigger than that, that I did not create or invent. But I have the joy of knowing that it exists and it's in the trees and it's in the wind and it's in the music and it's in the silence. And I feel like all of the stuff that arises that we interact with kind of consciously is arising from what we would call nothingness as if that means it's empty. But being empty of form is not empty of life. So the ability to know that there is something I can belong to that doesn't have to be called God or something specific. I, I like to call it aliveness, just the aliveness. Sometimes um, I've, I have taught in the past at San Francisco State University and I teach people here and there in different settings. 
And, and I love just asking them, you know, did you ever think that your aliveness would be looking back at you? And there's something to that, like the Ouroboros, like if my life is looking at me, I'm accountable now. I have someone or something to show up for. There's a reason I'm here. And if I don't know what it is, it's my job to find out. To me, that's what responsibility is. And if I'm lucky enough to not live in a war-torn country, for instance, where I'm not constantly wondering about my physical safety and freedoms, then the least I can do to say thank you for that gift in terms of the luck of where I was born, what I was born into, family and location and era, you know, um, then anything I can do that facilitates my responsibility to the consciousness that I carry is essential. It has to happen. And that's not easy. It's not an easy journey. So how do you feel the role of sound impacts as a facilitator to kind of usher in that energy or, or help other people open up to it? So using sound as a way to facilitate people's own personal um, interaction with themselves, with themselves as a collective in a collective, a living, a beautiful, magical living system within a, a network of communicating interdependent living systems. Sound is, I think sounds really clever. And, and to me, sound is clever because the universe itself is vibratory in nature. So everything is kind of moving all the time. Sometimes it's really obvious and sometimes it's just the subtle movements. A cell, anything that's alive, you know, it's moving, it's moving. And, and there's conversation going on in different languages, you know, but, but the language of vibration is constantly occurring. What I've noticed using sound with people, it, and there are different settings in which I'll use sound. So in a sound healing setting, what happens is that a person actually, they'll have, they might have a severe acute or chronic physical pain. And something about the sound, knowing how to travel, like plant medicine actually, it's the same principles, travels into that person's field into their body and their body has the right to say yes or no to the influence of that energy. It's not my energy. I'm just the UPS guy. <laughs> it's some energy, right? And that's my job is to deliver. You know, oh, I've got to deliver this on time. Someone's asked me to deliver. So here I am delivering. And there is an intelligence in the receiver of that, an intelligence beyond the cognitive psychological intelligence. It's a, it's a systemic intelligence, if you will. And that takes it in, does whatever it does with it, reorganizes, and sometimes the experience is intense for the person, but it passes, and so does the pain. And that's true for the mind, and that's also true for our emotions. So there's that. So there's the ability to experience sound as a way to get beyond the entrapment of suffering. Another place that I've used sound that I find uh, really fascinating is there are people that gather for meetings, for instance, and I was asked to come in. I knew nothing about how they ran their meetings, but they're sort of spiritual meetings. And they're two hours long and they would decide, they'd use the first hour almost to decide what to meditate on, and then the second hour to do the meditation. Not knowing this, I was simply invited in to sing. So I sang for like a minute or two at the beginning. And then I just watched. And I watched them decide within about three, four, five minutes max exactly what to meditate on. And then they got on with it. It was only later they said to me, and I did this two weeks in a row. And then they said, by the way, Claire, usually it takes us 40 minutes to an hour to actually come to a coherence around what we're going to focus on. But something about sitting in the sound field with you, we were all on the same, we found a, a shared truth about what mattered to us in that moment collectively and could go whoosh, like straight into it. 
So I think of that and I, I think of parliaments and policymakers, you know, high level politicians who are making all these unbelievably important decisions every day that affect millions of people. And if they're not coherent compared to if they are coherent, I, I think about that. I think about if I could sit with these people, they don't have to know me. They don't have to have anything to do with me in a way. I can just sit there and do my sound alchemy. That's where it's a bit different, the sound alchemy to sound healing. Gosh, I wonder how quickly it might be possible to see different results, to see people coming from a coherent space. There's a thing called heart math, and they talk about heart intelligence. And although I haven't studied it deeply personally, I have an awareness of it. And I wonder if it has something to do with that, those principles. So that then people are joined, even if they come from different theologies, different belief systems and so on, different backgrounds. There is a place where we can cohere and come together. And it doesn't matter that we have differences it, because there's no conflict between the differences and the coherence. So can you elaborate a bit on first the power of intention in sound healing as it relates to the person receiving and the person giving? And is there a relationship there? So you're asking about, I guess, I guess what I'm considering here is then the relationship between the recipient of a sound in a house in a sound healing session the recipient and me as the giver do we have to be in agreement in order for something to happen is is that kind of the question yeah and, and uh sort of if how their their intention coming into that might affect their results or how they how they okay. receive what you're what you're giving so if the question is about intention, like does a person coming for a sound healing, how does the way they come in affect what can happen next? So again, to refer back to dynamic emergence, I would say, yes, it does affect. How we show up for anything at all will influence what happens next. We can't avoid that. There is no separation at all between the who I am and the what I help generate. So this ability to become more and more self-aware, more mindfully present, more personally accountable to the space that I am and how that pollutes or enhances or is neutral in any other shared environment, that's real, that's tangible. And I think as humans, we can forget, understandably, that if we can't see something, we sort of think it's not there. And if I, so what does that mean? If I can't see my organs, do I not have organs, right? There's a physicality to that question that's a bit silly, but, you know, when we think about thought and the more um, sort of, or the less tangibly identifiable aspects of the who we are, that's a bigger question. We're not so well versed so well rehearsed, so well educated, actually, unless you go to a therapist, right, which means you have to have a certain motivation. But things I think that can deny the possibilities of our own evolution and growth and expansion and becomingness are cynicism, um, hostility, fierce anger, and being closed off. I think th these are states of being that can probably stop positive healing things from happening. Because in a way, that person is simply just saying no. And if they're saying no, they have every right to say no. It's not for me, again, to have an opinion about that. I might have feelings about it, but for me to make a judgment about it would be very ignorant because I don't know that person's path. I don't know their story. I might not be meant to know it. 
So coming open, that's all. Curiosity and openness, I think, are really key elements in any being for something magical to be able to express itself. And that's true for me too. So that's why I can't have an opinion. It doesn't serve me or the situation to have an opinion. So if a person comes for a healing, I'll ask them what's going on and I'll let, let it be expressed. And then I just sing. So I, I often won't necessarily think, now I'm going to go here because they said they have a problem here in their body. I try not to have an opinion. And I just trust that if I am really transparent to this, this energy that wants to come through, then that's probably the best job I can do. Can you elaborate a bit more on um, the difference between sound alchemy and sound healing? Uh, I can elaborate more on the difference between sound alchemy and sound healing. I have always thought of myself really as a sound healer. And so what that means to me is that I'm deliberately using sound, engaging with sound to facilitate some kind of a shift for a person in their physical, mental or emotional state. So they come, I sing, I'm thinking of myself as a healer. And, and there's an intention to, I guess, create an improvement in a situation. So I think that's how I think of sound healing. So healing is at the core of it. Recently, more recently, I got introduced to the concept of sound alchemy. Now, sound alchemy is, I think, even bigger than that and that sound healing fits inside of it as kind of a component. But when I think of sound alchemy, now that I've kind of got that reference point, alchemy is to change something. I don't know that that is exactly the same as healing something. But I think that alchemy has to do with evolving a space, transforming. So an alchemist is a magician, a sorcerer, or uh, it's transformation. Sound alchemy is, is a larger kind of reference point to consciousness itself. So although healing is related to consciousness, I think sound alchemy is, it can have multiple intentions to it. And, and I just think of it as a more cosmological reference point. I don't know if there's more I can say than that, but it's definitely to do with transforming a space, whether the space is geographical, emotional, uh, relational. Um, but yeah, it has to do with transformation in general, which was which is where the idea of me singing a uh, parliament or in meetings that although there might be a healing experience in that, the sound alchemy is to trans transcend the limitations that having an ego imposes on us. So I feel like it kind of blows the lid off the roof. Anything, anything that's sort of doing this just blows it off and says, bring it in, bring it on. Let's see. Let's see who we are without these imposed limitations, most often self-imposed, but also imposed by others. So what's your favorite instrument? I, I actually love all my instruments. My favorite instrument I suppose I'd have to say voice because it's my primary instrument. But my Shruti is, if I think of an, any instrument that's not me, then it's the Shruti. But I also have a, a grand piano that I grew up with, a Beckstein, that anyone that knows me uh, I probably has an affectionate memory of me having to move countries, move locations with a grand piano. And they're like, how do you do that? But that piano I've had since I was about, um, I think, 10, something, 10 years old. So it, I f it sort of feels, it's family, you know. And then the Shruti as well, even though I've only had the Shruti about, golly, I don't know, eight years, 10 years. Um, you know, it got stolen from me once and I grieved 
like you wouldn't believe that like I couldn't get over it. <laughs> Not a good example of non-attachment. Um, but then I remembered I'm part of a dowsing community and I asked them to help me locate it and they did. So after two months of it having been stolen, I got it back. And that, that, that really blew my mind actually. So like that was a so such a tangible example for me of alchemy in action, right? Not just some out there concept, a theoretical concept, but it's like, no, you, you know humans that do this, they find things. And so when they actually did, it's like, my God, this stuff's real, all of it. So the Shruti is such an amazing companion for me. Like all my performances that I do, whether it's at Grace Cathedral or in Greece or here in my living room where I do lots of my sound healing work, the Shruti provides me, it's like my magic carpet and it creates this beautiful kind of drone sound. And as soon as it kicks off, my whole field just goes, oh, here we go. And I feel safe and, um, and I travel with it and then I take people with me. So if I'm doing like a sound meditation, will it's amazing people at the same time will be going to completely different places in their interior sort of travelogue uh, and quite often because what i do is channel sort of um elemental spirits and the spirit of water the spirit of the wind the spirit of gaia the spirit of pain and suffering i am so raw when i'm singing I'm so open to transmitting that um, that's what I think people know me for. And the Shruti is, in a way it's my grounding cord, but at the same time, it's what makes me travel all the way out there, all the way in there. So definitely my ally, we've known each other in other lives, I think. <laughs> Um, can you share some stories about people that you've worked with in sound healing where you've seen a transformation or, or yeah uh, thinking of a couple of people that I've worked with doing sound healing and like the actual things that I've been able to witness that have astounded me and I'm meant to be the one that's like oh yeah this works this totally works um, there are two people that come to mind. One is called Captain Dave, and he lives on a boat in, uh, in, Lon in Jack London Square in Oakland, California. And I was introduced to him. Like one day I got a phone call from somebody and they said, oh, come down to the boat and there's someone I want you to meet. Oh, by the way, bring your Shruti. I'm like, all right. So I hopped in the car, went down there and met Captain Dave. So he told me his story. And as he told me the story, luckily we filmed it too. As he told me the story, um, I was aware of certain questions I needed to ask him. And so we sort of began. And as soon as I start talking with someone, it kicks off. It's like, and I warn people ahead of time, as soon as you start talking, things are going to happen. So let's make sure we're ready for this. Um, don't casually give me information because I might not be able to act if I'm not already in the right setting with you and it'll get lost. But anyway, so Dave told me that 35 years earlier, he's in his sixties, he had been deliberately run over by somebody who was kidnapping his children. And as I said, I, you know, I asked some follow up questions, but the end result of that was that something in his lower back was broken not to the point where he was paralyzed, but to the point where he had to live every day since then with a chronic and acute pain. He had gotten so used to that. And for some reason, he had resolved not to have the surgery. I think the surgery that was available back then was not really guaranteed to work and had perhaps some um, possible dangerous long-term side effects. And so he chose not to have it. He chose to just manage his pain. Then he meets me. He has the sound healing. During the sound healing, I noticed his breathing 
gets really, really intense. To the point where I'm sitting there watching him thinking, like, and I'm watching his, his hands are like this, his whole arms are like rocks. And I'm thinking at any moment, he's gonna flail out. And he, if he does, I'm gonna get like a bonk in the head. So I was like watching kind of like this, ready to grab his arm, like to deflect if that's what happened unconsciously. And he went in and out of these breathing patterns and I just sat with him and I held space. Afterwards, he told me that it was the first time that he had breathed all the way through the pain because I made him lie on his back, like flat. He wanted to lie at a certain angle that he was used to, to avoid the pain. So it's like, no, this, this is what has to happen. And so he said that was the first time he'd ever actually stayed with the pain, however horrible it got, and breathed it out. It made me think of people delivering babies, like people having babies. It's like the breath is incredible. So there was that. And then I spoke with him like a week later. And it turns out that he had an entire week. Remember, this is 35 years, every single day of pain. He had an entire week, no pain. He could move, he could walk, he could do everything that everyone else might be able to do, who's also not suffering from pain in that way. And he made a big life changing decision, which was he was going to go and have that surgery. And I remember one of my first thoughts, because I am a human, was, oh, it only lasted a week, you know. And then I had this insight. It's kind of like that thought went out and then another thought came in pretty fast and just said, Claire, he's just had the chance. And this is actually what he had said to me, that he had a chance to see what his life could look like that it didn't actually have to be all about pain management and that he could make a new choice. And the surgeries now that are available are much better. And so he's gone ahead and started that process to have the surgery. He would not have done that without the healing because it gave him, it kind of lifted off the burden of pain suffering management and gave him a chance to experience freedom. And those are his words. So I was, I was really thrilled because I suddenly realized, oh my God, I really did help. Like I really had an effect. So um, that's Dave. And then there was another lady called um, Kat. And she had been on a boat and broken her finger. She slipped and fell and broke her little finger, pinky. And I came to meet her and uh, my producer for lunch as they were sailing up towards the Delta in Sacramento to go to an event called Ephemeral. And we had lunch and I looked at her finger and her whole hand. And I'm like, my God, you know, tell me about that. And she said, oh yeah, I, I slipped over and I broke it. I'm like, but it's not even splinted. And she, you're just carrying on as normal. And she goes, well, I can't really use the arm or the hand. So, and she's a production assistant, so you need like two hands. I said, would you like some help with that? Would you like a little bit of healing? And she said, yes, please. So we turned and faced each other and I just started working on her. And it kind of basically looks like this, you know, your hands kind of move and then they start going out, whoosh, 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 out, out, and out. And the thing that blew my mind even though I've been doing this for years, is that her hand was kind of like this, so thick with swelling, and this part was all purple on both sides, all the way up here, purples and blues. And as I watched my hands just hovering over it, I literally, with these eyes that are talking to you right now, I watched it go down. I watched the swelling go down and all I could think was, oh, if only I had taken a before picture because I want to measure the difference. You know, it's like, this is real. And so even now I still get that sort of joy of seeing something about it, how it actually works. Because when you hear someone talk about, oh, I feel more relaxed or, you know, I feel um, happier. I'm, that's fantastic. But to see the physical stuff, shift that's what blows my mind you know even though i know nothing is fixed 
to see it actually go down. And by the way, all the color went. So there was a tiny bit of purple left on this side, but otherwise it all, you know, and she could move it. She showed me and she hadn't been able to do anything with it at all. Why do you think it comes as a surprise to, to even you when you see your work work? <laughs> <laughs> Why am I surprised that what I do works? That's a really big question. And I, I'm not sure if I know the answer to that question. Um, there's an innocent in me that feels like I'm constantly at the beginning of something. And I suppose there's a, um, I don't know if it's more self-doubt or humility. It might be both. So there's self-doubt because I don't think anything's guaranteed at all. And so that, that, that's why I kind of show up to things like with big eyes and curiosity. And because I feel like I'm a student of life every day. I always feel like I'm learning. And even though I feel like I know certain things, whether, that, whether it's just because I know it in my bones or because I've seen it enough times, I really hope I never get complacent over sort of the miraculous phenomena of life itself. So I guess what I'm witnessing is life, right? Life's talking. So in the hand going up or down or Dave's back or someone else having another experience. Even though I know about the magic of life, the alchemy of life, to witness it, like when the, the dowsers found my Shruti, to have the magic confirmed or affirmed in real time with me as a witness, it just blows my mind because I know the universe is extraordinary. I know that being here is ridiculously like unexplainable. It really is. You can call it God. That doesn't actually explain it. That just points to a location point of origin. But it's like, I love, I just love being surprised. I love being reoriented because I can become cynical too. I can become complacent. I can assume things. You know, if I ever go to a performance and I'm not nervous or somehow slightly more awake and alert, then where am I, you know? Do you have any personal stories of how sound healing has affected you or transformed parts of yourself? With regard to sound healing and me, when I, when I sing, like when I sing, for instance, at Grace Cathedral, but even if I just sing on my own in the living room, the effect is the same. And the effect is that something in me comes, you remember those old fashioned cameras where when you focused on the lens, it would go like this. And then once it was a pure circle, you knew it was fully focused. So when I sing, something in me becomes coherent. My mind disappears. All of my self doubt, my self judgment, my questions, my decisions, my concerns, all the crowded, stuff that sits in the waiting room of my mind, waiting for my attention, waiting for me to resolve it, waiting for me to have some amazing insight. All that burden disappears. And when I take pictures of myself before, because I do this, I'm, I have a slightly scientific mind that wants to prove things as well as just the intuitive self that is, is experiencing the proof, right? And it's not really looking for it. Um, I am light. I am literally light. Like it just, I just turn into this sort of beam of light. And I feel completely unburdened. I have a really crunchy mind sometimes, like it likes to figure things out. And that's a bit of a job, 
right? And I put all that into dynamic emergence. It's like, okay, let's just get this out of here and put it there and share that because it explains a lot of things and it's actually kind of helpful. A lot of people are orient through their rational mind. So to have a way to understand in a kind of simplified explanation what this is to be a human energy field and what that carries with it and the potential to that it carries with it. When I sing all of that, it just goes away. I mean, it still exists somewhere, but I'm not carrying it like a pack horse, you know. So I really appreciate that. And, and, it, and it just, there's so much noise that can happen when I'm not focused and clear. And when I choose to become present through singing and sounding or writing a song, you know, or painting an energy ball, or painting anything, or writing a poem, or writing an article, just expressing it. You know, sound healing is one way, but like I said earlier, there's so, so many ways to, to clear our fields and to restore spaciousness. And then you can have like this direct eye contact. So. Can you talk a bit about what it's like to be a healer, but at the same time be going through your own healing process and how those play off each other. It's an interesting thing to be a healer, right? To have that job title and at the same exact time to be a human being. Oh my God. Depending on where I'm sitting inside myself, those two are conflicted. And at other times, there's room and the healer can hold the human that I am with compassion and spaciousness. If I'm dominant human and the healer part is like down here somewhere, this human can get really mean and like peck, peck at me and tell me I'm not good enough or that I can't teach things if I'm not somehow already perfect at them. Or, um, oh God, yeah, you know, who are you to be saying this and why should anyone listen to you and all those kinds of things. And then I think, well, I should just wait. And then it's like, but the world's burning. And then I think of people who maybe had an accident. Maybe they were a sports coach and they had an accident. What, so they just stop being a sports coach. All that knowledge, all that information, all that love that could be helping other people develop whilst they are being human. That has, they all have to lose out. So that's kind of the dialogue that I sit with when I'm in the middle of a human personal crisis, you know. I either have to have a friend remind me or I have to remind myself, it's all right, Claire. Part of being a teacher is being actually human. And as long as I can articulate what I'm going through in a way that doesn't burden someone else who's a student, for instance, but allows them to see how it works to be with my neuroses or my doubt or my pain or my questions. Like if I can contextualize them by some kind of calm honesty, then I think that's okay. I think it's if I'm hiding, like, you know, you hear of gurus that, that sort of hide their pain in sexual behaviors or dominant behaviors or just somehow deflecting themselves so that people just see this sort of incredible guru that's so perfect and then whoosh, they fall like politicians too. So the hiding, I think, is where the problem comes in perhaps. So I try not to hide. I mean, I want to hide for a bit if it's acutely painful and I don't have a sense of direction yet, but there's a point in time where I always get that back. I ask for help from so many different places and it's there, it's available. And then whoosh, gradually that, that drama that whirls me around and disorients me 
that I participate in. It settles just enough. This is always comes back to noise signal ratio for audio engineers and people that work with sound. The noise is the mind and the signal is the wisdom, I think. The compassionate wisdom, the ability to be with. That actually reduces the noise and it just holds and then that should just keep turning down till you get back to presence. She says, as if that's so easy, which it's not always. Beautiful. Um, so do you, I'm trying to think of how I want to articulate this next question. Do you feel like sound healing is acknowledged by the mainstream medical community? And do you think it has a future in mainstream medicine? Like, do you see it mm. becoming bigger in the collective awareness? <laughs> you ask these great questions, they're so big. <laughs> um, what place does sound healing, especially the kind I do, but there's so many different kinds of sound healing, but what place does sound healing in general have in the allopathic medical field, basically? Because it's, it's thought of as an alternative medicine, right? Um, and I don't even know if any health insurance companies yet recognize it as um, something that they cover. The thing is, it's already in the medical field. We use it uh, in sonograms, right? We use light. Like we use things we can't see as ways to measure health and illness. So it does already exist. If I'm wondering about whether or not it will carry on existing or exist in a more sort of um, formal way, I think the inevitable answer is yes. Partly because it uses so few resources, right? It, you're not having to be in a lab generating special chemicals, testing drugs for years and years and years. We know this works, it's simple. Um, if there's been any hesitation about bringing it in, partly it would be to do with our own education and partly it would be to do with um, Big Pharma feeling like their profit line might get threatened. That's a possibility. So um, I think that there are people trying to bring, like chiropractic for instance, I'm sure there was a time where that wasn't considered professional. Now that's covered, you know. Uh, acupuncture, same story. These traditions go back for centuries. They're not new and sound healing isn't new either. So I think it's just a matter of time and persistence and persistence just meaning that people like me and people doing work similar to my, my own work, whether it's more um, electronically generated sounds or more acoustically generated like I do, then I think it's inevitable. I mean, because we need it. That's the bottom line, we need it. It's here, we need it, it's available, it works. It's, it's relatively inexpensive. <laughs> so why wouldn't it? Yeah, so uh, what's next for Claire Edine in life? When I think about what's next for me, I have to go quiet because I have to listen for it. It's a big question. I feel like right now I'm at a change point again, a nexus point. What I've noticed for me personally over the last few years is um, an ever increasing awareness and deepening of my relationship to the elemental world. And I have a genuine active, like some people have an active relationship with their husband or wife, I have an active relationship with the elements, the wind, the sea, the sky, the trees, the aliveness that's inherent in all life. Life is sentient, life is intelligent, life is creative. I participate in that conversation. That's what I'll miss when I'm not here anymore. 
Although who knows what the conversation becomes anyway after this. So what's next for me is I have um, a CD that's just been completed called Singing the World to Peace. And I've started collaborating with other artists, visual artists. I've started painting again. I feel like what matters to me is to be in communication with as many people as possible, talking about our consciousness, talking about our intelligence, talking about our creativity. I feel like those three ingredients are our magic. They're our magic potion and they're in us by design. So I feel like my work is to bring forward into more mainstream reality the acceptance and exploration and curiosity of humanity to find out who are we really. And this is not about theology. This is about energy. It's about our metaphysical design and how we belong in a metaphysical universe. Um, some people have difficulty with that language, which is why dynamic emergence can be helpful because it approaches it from a very rational perspective. And then when I do my art stuff, um, then we're moving more into the liminal, the numinous, the ethereal sometimes, where it's more of a sensory interaction that is informing a way of knowing and a way of being. So for me, it's always about going deeper, paying closer attention, letting go of old dramas, perhaps, you know, so that I can live that noise to signal ratio, live more in the signal, less in the noise. And going on a journey. So I'm going to be traveling for a while, doing sound healings where those opportunities present, um, giving talks, teaching online with dynamic emergence, teaching people individually, doing massive sound healings for people because it works individually in unique ways to what each person needs. So I don't even need to worry about that, that my delivery will only help one person. It's like, no, no, it, it, it knows what to do. I don't, I don't have to know how it does it. I just know that it does it. So performing, I love performing. And yeah, just things like that. Awesome. There's one more thing that might sound a little weird, but I wonder if there's anything else you'd want to say, any parting words, and maybe even something that you kind of just like pull in as kind of like a, you know, like a parting, yeah. a parting wisdom, or it could be anything. Hmm. We are made of love. We're made of a cosmic spirit. There is an earth waiting to talk to us. She's trying. There's a cosmos that is aware of us and it's watching. We are so little and so dynamic. If we can find our way to connect with a, a profound understanding of the gift that we have by being here, by having this one precious life. If we can connect with that and see that in each seed of a person, respect that, revere that, support that and love that we can bring into being a world that can sustain itself. Forests that can breathe for us. Air that will fill our lungs with joy and health and happiness. Environments that can support us when we're down and lost. There is no need for a world in which people do not belong. There is no hierarchy of cleverness or rightness. 
love is not always soft and fluffy, but it is deeply, deeply intelligent and old. It is ancient. It seeks to experience itself through our connections. It waits for us. It is compassionate, as is grief. So feel our feelings fully. We cannot bypass our feelings. I know how much we want to. I know how much I want to too. But that shortcut is a long road. Ask for help when you need it. And give love when you feel it. And don't hide. Your beauty belongs in the world. <laughs>